uh, went into the city because of the driving time and oh, yeah. the yeah. school situation with Zach having to ride the bus uh, every day. Oh, that's such a drag. Right. Know, yeah, so. Right. 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 Anyway, what do you want to do? I just want to just. Uh, I, I know very little of your story. I was just informed about it last week, but um, you're a World War II veteran, and, and I understand right. you you were you, you saw quite a bit. Well, uh, I, what, what was your what was your what was your branch? You were uh, and you served in the Pacific. Is that right? Yeah, Marines generally Marines? Are in the Pacific, mostly. Fleet mm -hmm. FMF, Fleet Marine Force. They're almost always Pacific. If you get anybody that's ETO, the European Theater, or something like that, it. It's detached duty, it's yes. embassy guard or something like that. But it's, right. now, of course, the Marines are all over the place. But sure. Basically, our job in World War II was just to, to go up the South Pacific Islands uh, into the Central Pacific and just secure enough of them so we could get fighter scripts and bomber scripts. Because that was, uh, you know, right. you had to take the little piece of real estate uh, one at a time. Right, and, right, uh, right. And of course, the big move was... Uh, the army, I think, in uh, New Guinea, uh -huh. to head off the Japs from invading Australia. Right. You know that was pretty much the, sure. the picture there. So uh, we did, and uh, I've got a checkered history actually in the Marine Corps. Uh, I went in on December the nineteenth in forty-one, just after Pearl Harbor. Right. So uh, I mean, I'll just lay this where, out where for you. you. Where, where were you from? Where, where uh, Chicago. You... Chicago. Chicago land. I was in. The, we lived in the suburbs. Okay, of oh, Chicago. Okay. Yeah, and uh, after they made us mad when they bombed Pearl Harbor, and none of us even knew it, where Pearl Harbor was at the time. Right. <laughs> so we, we found out, so we all decided, well, we're all going to go down and join a service, and uh, oh, about 10 or 12 of us, well, two guys showed up, myself and my buddy Harry Palmer, who <laughs> lived next door to me. But I went down, and I got in the Marine Corps that day, and they, they wouldn't take him because he had a... Uh, broken his elbow and wasn't able to straighten his arm all the way out and at that time they were pretty particular uh -huh. and so I I left right then that night went out to San Diego went through boot camp and uh, then moved to a, a camp right out of San Diego Camp Elliott and the Marine Corps only had two divisions at that time the first and the second divisions and they were already deployed somewhere the second I think went to Iceland and you know so they wanted to form the third division, which is good. That's, uh, you know, we need more men. Mm -hmm. uh, divisions about twenty thousand guys. Right. Yeah. So uh, we formed uh, and trained there at Camp Elliott and did all the infantry stuff. You know, and then uh, but we were no sooner trained and they cut us in half and sent half of us to the East Coast. So now we get to do the same thing again with the fourth division. Mm -hmm. uh, this is getting old. Yeah. yeah, getting old. Right. Because yeah, I just wanted to fight Japs. You know? Sure. And uh, so my buddy Red Phillips and I just decided that we were going to uh, get in some action, buddy. You know? So we went over, uh, went to first sergeant and told him we wanted to go to the parachute school. So we did. We went to parachute school right there at uh, uh, New River Marine Base. They had a, mm -hmm. the towers and everything there. So we graduated from there. They sent us over to New Caledonia and they. Marines only had two battalions of parachute troops at that time. It wasn't even a regiment, uh, the first and the second. So they sent us over there, and they had formed a, a third battalion here. They sent them over. Now we were big enough to be called a regiment, okay? uh -huh. but a very small regiment. The average line company would have at that time maybe 200 to 12, 215 men in it. Our, our companies were, were like 175. I mean, everything was reduced down, even the size of the weapons, so that you could, you know, get them out of the airplane with you, and that uh -huh. type of thing. So uh, we went to New Caledonia, which was no fighting there, it was just an old French penal colony, and uh, we trained there as a regiment and uh, made a couple of practice jumps there, but so many guys were getting hurt. You know, once you know how to get out the door of the airplane, you know, why keep practice jumping because you're just kill. you know, you're, right. just, you're just running. Right. Yeah. So they said, all right, we're not going to make any more jumps. So that was all right. You could do six in school and then a couple, three more after that, some with steel helmet and other things that you weren't used to in school. You get the feel of it and 
I think, so we just uh, laid around New Caledonia. Meanwhile, the 3rd and the 4th Division went right around us and got in action, both of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> while you were practicing. Yeah, while we were practicing. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was so ticked <laughs> off at that. Yeah, we, anyway, we ended up uh, moving up into Solomon's uh, in the Parachute Regiment uh, uh, to Vela La Bella, which is another island in the Solomon. You know, you got Guadalcanal, Gavudu, Vela La Bella so on, right up to Bougainville, uh, that's the mm -hmm. top one. And uh, they uh, sent us into Bougainville. Uh, we didn't make the initial landing. We went in about uh, four or five days after they had established the perimeter. And we no sooner hit there and they said, all right, you guys are supposed to be such hot shot. Let's go up. There was a Hill 1000 was supposed to be the commanding uh, terrain. On the, in the Torquina River Basin. So we went up there and uh, had some, and it was as infantry. We never did make a combat jump. Right. You know? Right. So uh, uh, we did that, and then the Army relieved us. We came back to Guadalcanal and sat there just a couple of weeks, and then they, at that point, they decided, now this, we're getting into about, what, 1943. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know, we're beginning to get some momentum. Exactly. And. Uh, they didn't need all of the special troops. They, like the Raiders, the Marine Raiders, they were just a little uh, group of uh, people like we were. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not really effective. You're good for a, a little fast hitting something where you're going to send in a platoon or something and get out, but you're not going to win battles like that you know, mm -hmm. or hold islands. So they decided to disband the, uh, all of the special troops. and. Uh, Brought us back to the States, and what do you think? We got to form the 5th Marine Division. <laughs> now, that's three divisions I've been in. Mm -hmm. well, I can go to a reunion stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but the 5th uh, uh, was made up of uh, the Raiders, parachutists, uh, guys who had been in other actions. and uh, So we trained there in Camp Pendleton. Uh, most of them, a lot of them, uh, the 5th Division got to go to the big barracks and lived like uh, kings, you know, well, tent camp number three. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. Uh, and so uh, we uh, got in pretty good shape there. At that time, I went into um, Regimental Weapons Company because, okay, uh, going through the parachute uh, training, and even before that, in the 3rd Division, I went from rifleman to automatic rifleman, the BAR man, and then to the 60 mortars, you know, because in those days each platoon had a, a, a special weapons, we'd call it, uh, attached to it, uh, maybe two light machine guns and two 60 mortars, so that as a company or as a platoon, you're, you know, you're kind of reinforced a little bit, right. but something beside that. Because when I went in service, uh, Tom, I, I was issued in 1903 Springfield. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, yeah. the, the M1 hadn't even been invented then. My goodness. So uh, yeah. then moving from that, when I went into the parachute regiment, they said, aha, mortar training. So our regimental weapons company uh, was 81 mortars and air-cooled machine guns. Now, we're the regimental heavy weapons company. We're supposed to be available. If a company gets pinned down or gets in trouble, we can send people mm -hmm. there to do it. And uh, so. Regimental Weapons Company actually uh, in the 5th Division was 37 millimeter anti-tank guns and uh, half tracks with 75s on them. In other words, it's, it's, it's bigger, heavier stuff. And now I wouldn't have any idea what they would be. I mean, right. it would be massive firepower. Sure. But uh, so anyway, when we went uh, in the 5th Division, I got uh, it was in Regimental Weapons Company of the 28th Marines. Uh, and. Uh, we uh, trained there on Hawaii, then we went up to Iwo, landed on Iwo. And when was this now? When, when uh, that was 1945, February 45. Okay. When uh, we landed on Iwo, I do believe. I got stuff here that establishes that. Okay. And uh, our job as a 28th, we landed on uh, Green Beach, uh, which was the extreme left. And the, fifth, the rest of the 5th Division, the 27th, the 28th at here, 27th here and the 26th was in reserve, but that didn't last but a couple hours and they were pulled in. Mm -hmm. Then the 4th and the 3rd Division uh, were 
way on our right flank. So our job was to cut across the island. It was very narrow at that point, just several hundred yards across. It was, was to cut across there and turn and take Sarabachi, which is the mountain. And we needed that because they could observe from there everything that was happening down there. So we really needed to get that under our control. Mm -hmm. So that's what the 28th did. And it took four or five days, I think, and the flag went up and was essentially secured. Then we uh, turned and went up to the north end of the island. But on the way up there, a mortar shell went off next to me and it knocked me out. So I didn't get to go any further than that. That was after 10 days. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that's about the story. Yeah. <clears throat> you obviously, you, you say the flag went up. You know, obviously that's a very famous yeah. part of yeah. the war. The picture <laughs> that was taken, of course, and, yeah. and all of that. Oh, yeah. Did you see the flag go up? Yeah, I didn't see it go up. I mm -hmm. saw it up. You saw it up, right? Uh, we were still uh, uh, essentially uh, shooting. See, the 37 is a very flat trajectory. Uh, a weapon, and uh, our job was to uh, take out pillboxes right. because they didn't have tanks mm -hmm. to amount to anything. Sure. If they did, they had several of them, and they they buried them and just let the turret out, so to speak. You know, right. uh, this is a dumb move on their part. Right, <laughs> right. So that our job was to just uh, fire into pillboxes, and uh, one of the problems that we had there, Tom, is if you secured a pillbox. Uh, and you didn't even know if you did, but you fired in there enough, saw a lot of smoke come out, and then you'd go and do something else. Uh, they would just be in the cave, mm -hmm. and then they'd come right back up. Right. So, we, you know, we really weren't, with a direct hit, you weren't really necessarily knocking something out. Exactly. You, you, were, you were helping, but uh, anyway. Right. Um, it's just amazing the caves that they had there. Yeah. They went in because we bombed that thing and shelled it for hours and, and days weeks right. before we went in and they just popped right back up right right and i'm sure a couple of them got a little shell shock but i don't yeah it didn't really uh, do what if, you know if the troops were all on the surface we'd have wiped them out we'd have just walked through that place right. but they were they were able to get cover because right. they had owned that island for uh, some 20 years and they had all the time in the world to, to work on it and the uh, Big reason that we wanted it, needed it, uh, was because as by that time we were bombing Japan with the B-29s, and mm -hmm. they were coming out of the Marianas. Okay, so they'd, they'd get up there, uh, they'd get mechanical problems, uh, they would be shot at and, and uh, shot up and uh, running out of gas and that type of thing on the way back, and it was a long way. Mm -hmm. But by having Iwo, we they, we were able to let those B-29s land there. Land. They, uh, I don't know the exact number. They landed on strips that had been built by CBs? Uh, well, the, the, CBs the, Japs, the Japs actually had some strips there, which of course we uh, messed up pretty good, but the basis was there, and I, I didn't get to uh -huh. research any of that. But yeah, it would have been CBs. Yeah. And, uh, uh, they, they got them back in operation. As a matter of fact, we were still fighting for the island when the first B-29 landed. I'd be, I'd be darned. Yeah. And oh. it, uh, the numbers, I'm just going to pull a number out. I, I think there's about uh, 1,100 planes used Iwo Jima. Right. Uh, that would have been essentially lost mm -hmm. because we didn't have any way to get out to them and so on like that to right. recover them like they did in the English Channel, which is 21 miles wide. Right. The plane went down there, they could dispatch people and a lot of times uh, help them. But uh, yeah. in our situation there, they wanted that only for that reason. Plus, we could also station fighters there now and then give the bombers protection over Japan. Right. So uh, it was kind of a a double bubble there, and it worked out real good. We lost, what, fifth, over 5,000 dead, but I think the amount of crewmen that were saved, I've seen the figure like 20,000, mm -hmm. which is a, an impressive number of men, but more impressive is... These are men that would have would have would, died just because of being shot up or... I mean, whatever, mechanical whatever. failure. They were know. able to land. They were able to, to, to mm -hmm. land, yes, sir. And. Uh, and if you were on the, in the 28th, is that right? 28th Marines. 28th Marines. 28th Marine Regiment. Or regiment yeah. of the 
5th Marine Division. 5th Marine Division. Yeah, each uh, division would have uh, uh, three regiments. We had 26, 27th, and 28th. And then, of course, you have your uh, regimental headquarters and service, which are your communications, motor transport. So, you know, you got right. your combat people, and then you got the support people. Right. And you went to par parachute school because you figured that would be your quickest route to get where the action was. <laughs> yes, exactly. But you yeah. never jumped out of a plane. Not, like, in, not in combat. Not no. in combat. No, yeah. but we had to do our training. Oh, yeah, yeah, your training. Yeah. But you were a ground soldier. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's yeah. all... <laughs> Uh, yeah, the parachutist too. So after right. you jump out of your airplane or yeah. a glider right. or whatever, once you hit the ground, you're a grunt. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly, exactly. But uh, yeah, that's. Uh, but when you went on to the the sands there at Iwo Jima, you had come off of uh, a boat. Is that right? Or yeah. Off of what kind of boat was it? Well, well one I was on the APA, APA something like 162. It was the Dickens, USS Dickens, mm -hmm. and these were ships uh, later in the war that were actually built to carry troops. I see. And so uh, we had a little better living conditions on those than when we'd get to some old uh, USS uh, Mount Vernon that had been a luxury ship, and they, mm -hmm. they pulled it out of the mud in New Jersey and made right. a troop ship out of it. Well, right. you get down in the bottom of those holes, and I'm, well, you know, I mean, this ventilation was non existent. Uh -huh. and just uh, a pretty bad scene there, but. What we finally figured out how what to do is as soon as you get aboard ship, you get a, a rack, you throw your gear on it, and then you run right up on deck and take your blanket and roll within, and you establish your place right there. Right. And that's where you sleep. And that's it. <laughs> they don't move. No, yeah. no. Uh, our, uh, a group of us would all get together. We'd play pinochle from morning till night. Right. Because that's all you had to do, except some physical training, you know, try yeah. to keep in shape. And, yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, you did a pretty good job of playing Pinochle and sitting there uh, reading the book or whatever until the, uh, we call them the deck apes, the, the, the Navy. They want right. to, they come by with the salt hoses and wash the deck down. They, right. they just delighted in doing that too. <laughs> so you were injured, did you say what, about 10 days into ten, your ten days mission at Iwo Jima? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what? No, it was what I call a Hollywood wound. It was just a shrapnel in, mm -hmm. in, in the arms, in and out, hit the bone, bounced out, uh, right. as compared to, uh, you get a Purple Heart for that, but every man who died in action got a Purple Heart too, so there's a difference. You know? yes. That's why we call one a Hollywood wound and the other one a Purple Heart. You know? Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, but you got your Purple Heart and you, you earned it, but that was the end of your combat then? Or yeah, because... Uh, they, did they send you to a, a hospital? Was there a hospital there on the island? Or no, where did they, no. Where did they... Did they I sent you, the... Uh, where'd you, where'd back, you go to get... Uh, I, to convalesce? Uh, took us out uh, and put us on an AKA, which is another new design ship. And it's a, basically a cargo ship. It's, mm -hmm. it's the one that brings the ammunition and that, where right. the APA, so an assault personnel attack or something like that, they were mainly for ma hauling men. Mm -hmm. The cargo ships were basically designed to uh, be able to offload ammunition and gas and things like that, and bigger right. bigger equipment, uh, tractors, bulldozers, and that. Were where did they take you? Oh, Guam. Guam? Yeah, I went to the hospital there. Uh, an army hospital there. And uh, I had no business being there. As a matter of fact, I was just looking at a couple of letters I wrote to uh, Jeannie. I, I, you know, I said, I can't hardly wait to get back to the outfit. This army hospital is killing me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, no, this is a lot of this stuff's going to be off the record. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, but while I was there, I uh, went down to the strip and took a ride in the B-29 that they were repairing. And mm -hmm. So we flew out and around. Oh, man, it's a big airplane. Yeah. You, know, you get to sit in that bubble and look out. Yeah, like look out over it all. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then I came back to the States because the war was winding down and uh, I was getting ready to get out of Great Lakes and get to back to the West Coast, uh, you know, into a casual company and then be sent back overseas because my guys went back to Hawaii and, uh, and they were training to 
you know, they upgraded our 37s to 57 millimeter guns, and mm -hmm. uh, we got tanks in instead of the half tracks, which proved to be absolutely useless in that sand. Right. Because they don't have a full track on them. They got the front wheels, and any time the, the track had the power, it would push the front wheels and it would just dig into that sand. Right. They were, they were dead in the water, really, on the beach. And I think so they were training for what they thought would be a ground war. Oh, yeah. In we Japan. Were to, 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 yeah. Right. Then at that point, uh, when the, the atomic bomb uh, was dropped, they went in shortly after that as occupation forces. Right. And uh, I was sitting there at Great Lakes, so I said, well, and by that time, you know, the war was over, essentially. Mm -hmm. That was in August of uh, 45. 45, yeah, right. yeah. Right, 60 years ago. Oh. Or 50, yeah. More than that. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, August of 40, or 45. 55 would be 60 years. That's right, right. yeah, 60 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah right, right, right. So there, there's a lot of things, Tom, that are, you know, the day-to-day -day life is is vague in my memory because sure. it's the same thing all the time. Right. You, go out, you wash clothes, you get up, you do your all calisthenics, mm -hmm. you do that. You know, it's a, it was a job. You did yeah. it. And, uh, and in I, those uh, 10 days, though, that you, from the time you landed to the time that you were, you were injured, were, were there, were you, were you in resistance then? I mean, were you... Were we fighting was there, all was the time? There combat going on oh, yeah. all the time? Just, huh? Yeah, Iwo Jima? Yeah, yes. just all the time. <laughs> all the time, night and day. Yeah. Right. Although and everybody wasn't necessarily involved in it, it was at night, you didn't move. Because yeah. you got other people around you, and all this, uh, what's the password and the countersign, forget that. You yeah, know? <laughs> right. If you see somebody move, and he's coming at you, you get ready. Yeah. And then you holler, and if he don't answer right, you shoot. You know. I mean, right. I didn't have exactly. to ever do that, but that's the philosophy because uh, it, this old password. Okay, halt. Who's there? Well, you say Chevrolet, mm -hmm. and then the countersign would be another General Motors car, Buick. Mm -hmm. Okay, you think you're friends. How long do you think it took the Japs to catch to on to something that. like that? Yeah, right. And uh, they infiltrated almost constantly at night. So one time. <laughs> Uh, Joan, not Jones, H.E. Uh, Wyndham, uh, he was one of my good buds. We, uh, it was about the fifth day, something like that, and uh, we got in the hole and got some tin over us, and it was nice and warm in there, so we took turns, you know, catching up on our sleep a little bit, and uh, then in the morning they, would, they passed the word, because, uh, you know, we had guys all over. It wasn't like a trench or anything like that, I mean, it was just debris and people were in it and on it and under it mm -hmm. and so the you know they, hey they came through last night so we got to let's go out and get them so then you know, everybody you get up and you start looking for them mm -hmm. well Wendy and I were walking along there and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a grenade striker go off as you know it snaps <laughs> snaps like that you know what it is when it, uh, okay I'm going to kind of treat you like you don't know anything okay uh, a hand grenade uh, the handle Right. The pin, and you pull the pin, and when you let go of the handle, what happens, there's a little striker in there, it's only about that long, it's spring-loaded, and it goes pop, it turns over like that, and it snaps the top end of a, a cap, mm -hmm. and that fire lights a fuse, and the fuse, is, uh, at first in the war, they were uh, five to seven seconds, which means that uh, if you threw it out real close like that, and the guy could pick it up and throw it back at you. Yeah. Uh, so then he, they changed that to three to five mm -hmm. uh, later on. So you, you get to know what they sound like when they snap like that. And we heard this snap, and you can't tell where it is. But right. we, it's close enough that we could hear it. We yeah. knew it was right around here. We bumping into each other, finally hit, uh, hit the deck, and you hope you don't hit on top of it. The damn thing went off, and it was an illuminating grenade, one that just flares up in lights mm -hmm. instead of a... Uh, Fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So we said, "Hey, hey man, wow, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah." So those ten days were obviously the, that. When you think back to your experience in the war, those ten days have to come through to you. It's a big. Uh, Rather, I mean, it was an intense ten it. days. Yeah, there right. was no pinochle being played in those uh, ten oh, days. No, sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, 
Yeah, it, it, it sure was. But let's see what we ran into, Tom, with, is we got the pillboxes that were up on Sarabachi all the way up. I don't know if you've ever <coughs> seen a picture of them, right. but uh, they had pillboxes up there. Well, our, a 37, you can only raise so far. It's got an elevation on it, that's yeah. all. Uh, just not very far. Right. And so uh, the 37s became kind of useless because once you got the bottom uh, tiers cleared out, our infantry was already there. The rest is a 28. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when your guys are at a pillbox, you don't shoot into it, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't shoot at it, you know. So they would uh, do that. Uh, so I couldn't use the 37, so I ran down to the beach, which was only a hundred and some yards or so, and our beach was just littered with wrecked uh, LCVPs, you know, the landing craft that we came in on, and every one of them had a 50 caliber on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went down and got one of those, and lugged it back up there, and I don't know who it was or how it happened, but somebody scrunched a uh, tripod for me. Because you can't fire a 50. <laughs> right. Uh, so you got to have the tripod to put it on there. And unfortunately, the Navy hadn't t taught the people on the, the, the little craft how to use these things or clean them or anything. So it was all loaded with cosmoly, which is a, a grease. Uh, I think when they manufacture them and they're all finished, they heat them and they dip them in this stuff mm -hmm. and let them, it soaks in. And take them out, and it kind of it congeals, and that and, uh, they wrap it, and then they can ship it under some pretty wet conditions and bad conditions. But when you get it, you got to clean it, get that greasy, thick grease off of it. So uh, this one was not clean uh, at all. I didn't even pay any attention to that. I got uh, some 50 caliber rounds, and I cranked twice, got it in there, but it wouldn't fire because the round wasn't seating all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't let it fire. When I finally, oh, I had to drop, take it all apart, and push that cosmoline out of the bore. I pushed it. Uh, if that thing had gone off, I'd have been wearing a, a, a face, you know, a back plate, my because mm -hmm. it would all blown back. Yes, sir. Anyway, once I got that cleaned out, then I used the 50 because now, see, I could raise the 50 up, and you can uh, with the tripod, uh, you can. Uh, set the gun and you can traverse you know you can lock it in position and then you you're, it isn't like this you know you, you can just you know two clicks this way right. and, uh, and a uh, click down and it raises it and moves it and you fire bang and you watch it if the rounds I was shooting was uh, what we, I call aircraft load it was uh, a one ball which was regular ammunition one armor piercing uh, one incendiary and one tracer Mm -hmm. And then back to the ball. So you could, I could see the incendiaries as they hit the pillbox, and boy, and pretty soon you don't see it anymore, and you know you're getting in there. So, yes. so it was kind of, kind of yeah. neat. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. What was after? Uh, so the war was over. You were back in the states. What, what did you do then? What was your career? What oh, did you? Oh, I. They just dumped us out practically. You know, right. It was all right because the war was over. We had done our job, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I came, I came back uh, and lived in Maywood, Illinois then, which is a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Great Lakes was right up there. Right. So, you know, I was able to get home. I was married at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get home and uh, once I got discharged, uh, uh, what did I do first? I think I yeah, it, it went to uh, machine design school. Mm -hmm. You know, it was under the GI Bill, mm -hmm. and then just progressed from that to different things. So ended up as a salesman in the Chicago area. And uh, what did you sell? The banking supplies. I see. Yeah, and printing. That was your main yeah. long time career. So that's yeah, what that you was, that was retired from, or uh, no, I quit from. <laughs> you quit from? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I see. Because it wasn't going any place. Branch banking was coming into Illinois, uh -huh. and see, our strength, Tom, was in calling on a bank. We had each one of us had like 90 banks. We would call on them on a regular basis, get to know the people, get their their trust, uh, and you could work your way up in an account until you're doing pretty good business with them, yeah. and they trusted you. 
But as soon as what we call branch banking comes in, where Continental Illinois will come out and he'll buy my best account out in, in Shiller Park. And then all of a sudden, I don't know the guy who's president anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, they sent somebody from downtown. Plus, they had central purchasing and that type of thing. So it began to erode at our, our yeah. structure there. And when did you come to Texas? Twenty years ago, something like that. Right. I'd have to. Uh, my oldest son had come down here. One of the ventures that we got involved in was an 18-wheeler and uh, things went pretty slow. So he came down here during the oil boom in, in the 70s to haul rock. And uh, we, Gene and I came down to visit him, liked it, decided that's what we were gonna do. That's where you're gonna be. And we're gonna do it. Right. And we did it. What kind of pictures, what do you have here? What, uh, what do you got? Just uh, kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, the record book didn't catch up with me, so when I was discharged, I was PFC. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, now I get correspondence from them, and it, it has corporal. So, corporal? Yeah. So it. you're a corporal. Yeah. Well, we're going to let just as long as the discharge says private first class. <laughs> okay. yeah, I don't want anybody calling up and saying, what are you like? <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is just real quick here on this one. Uh, and, uh, uh, this is in, in Washington. Uh, is this your here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that picture too. Yeah. Well, okay. I think uh, similar to that one. Right. That's over there. I think yeah. that, Sean made that for me. Yeah. No, that's different. See, I, that was when I came back because I got some campaign ribbons on. See, here I don't have mm -hmm. any, any on. So. But, uh, well, I know what I was going to ask you. The, the first time you were over there, that you went over, uh, you, you, what, what was your, what was your job then? The first time that well, you. Well, first were, time I went over it was as a, in the parachute regiment. In the parachute regiment. And I was an 81 millimeter mortarman. Okay. 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 Yeah. So there was there was combat involved then also. Right? Well, ultimately on Bougainville. Yeah, yeah on uh, Bougainville. But on Vela La Vela, uh, there were Japs on the island, but they were just a small number. We would send out patrols once in a while, and they would get fired up. But it wasn't any kind of big, big action. Yeah, we get it. We'd get air raids about every night. Right. And uh, right. No, they sometimes they would come close. Sometimes and we'd hardly hear them. You know? Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Bougainville is beyond. I mean, if you were going down the islands, <laughs> where's Bougainville in relation to Guadalcanal? You're going to show me. How would you like to be doing something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Not really, huh? Mm. Mm. Well, let's see, okay. There's Guadalcanal. Right. And these are the Solomons going up here, okay? Mm, there's Bougainville. Yeah. Now, it's that, that strip of islands right there. So. And is Iwo Jima on that map? No, uh, no. he was uh, up further. Right. Yeah. This would be Southwest Pacific. I think uh, I think he was considered Central Pacific. Right. So it's right. It's a right. 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 Uh, right. But let me get this out of the way. Yes. This, this, yes. This, go ahead. This is uh, uh, Frank's uh, with full military honors. At Arlington. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was mm -hmm. it was nice. The whole family got together and fortunately, well, I guess fortunately. Uh, the, when Frank died, uh, it, it was just a old age type of mm -hmm. thing. He, he just mm -hmm. kind of drifted away. And um, Michael, his son, wanted the full military honors. They couldn't do it for six weeks. So uh, a lot of the emotion had gone out of it by sure. that time. So we, right. were, we used it as a family as a reunion uh, type a, a get together mm -hmm. and, and a, a send-off to Frank. and. Uh, uh, there's EJ and his wife. And that's, you probably know that guy, Tommy VFW. He's the one who mm -hmm. first mentioned, you know, Doc Cooper. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's yeah. my doctor. Yeah, well, these two guys in Doc and him are uh, real close. Right. And uh, we were all there at the World War II uh, memorial. Okay, this is the the guy now who is a colonel. Mm -hmm. He was a lieutenant colonel, and that's Michael. Uh, this is his brother Joe. Mm-hmm. That's the sister. <laughs> that's that's Frank. This 
this boy here, he, he stood there. He's the honor guard. He stood there until the flag was safely in the car. I you know they gave it to mm -hmm. my sister-in-law, and they. Uh, but he he stayed there until that door was closed, and the car drove away. Then he he left this post there. I it, see. It was it was something else to see. I tell you. Now this is Randy. He's the one that's in the Coast Guard. Now Randy is. Uh... It's, it's, it's another son of, of Frank's. Frank's son, I see. yeah, because that's Frank right. there, and that's Randy. So Randy's a photographer. He works for the Corps of Engineers, I think. Uh, uh -huh. That was his, his specialty in, in service was uh, photography, and uh, he's been doing that for a long time. But, yeah, it was it was pretty darn good. And, and, and when was this again? Uh, I'm going to say in November of last year. Of, year. of 04, just about a year ago? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was a, a doggone impressive uh, thing to ride on this horse, you know, with the boots. Right. And, uh, this, these teams, they, you know, because that's all they do. And boy, they are so precise. And, and yes. the way they fold that flag and everything was done, you know, slowly. And, and this was another brother. He lives in Chicago. That's Bill. And uh, Mike. <laughs> it is a lot of... <laughs> Look like a midget. Uh, that's that's another nephew. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. How tall is he? Uh, yeah. Way out that, there. That like he looked like. like my yeah. goodness. And uh, just trying to. Okay, here's all the guys. This is uh, Joe, Pam, uh -huh. Mike. No, here's Joe, uh, Mike, Pam, Randy, and uh, this uh, is Sean. He's he's the major. No, oh, that's. No, well, that's somebody else. That's a friend of mm -hmm. ours. Because he's uh, Mike's a Marine. Uh, not Mike, uh, Sean's a Marine. So he'll have a different uniform. Anyway, that's, uh, uh, that was, you can tell my brother's out of here, ain't he? <laughs> and uh, in the parachute regiment, this was our, our book. Uh, we, we still get it, uh, but they've disbanded. They, we no longer have reunions mm -hmm. because it's, it's just... Uh, to get yeah, them all together. yeah. Well, and there's only 700 of us left. There's uh, it's a last man organization in that the Marine Corps does not have an active parachute uh, set up like the Army has, like the 101st and the 82nd. Uh, our we're not official, right? As a, as a unit, so uh, nobody there can't be any new people coming in. So we were we were just wearing down. Uh, to the point where <laughs> it just got to be a little much for the guys. But I do go to the 5th uh, Division reunion, which is called the Spearhead, and that's going to be uh, in Dallas. So oh, I okay. Last coming year, up in the next last year, year yeah. Gene and I went to it, and uh, it was uh, when, when, by golly, you know, I think Frank must have been 03. Because Gene and I went to the reunion in uh, Louisiana last November. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, don't get hung up on that stuff. Okay. <laughs> Here's the new leatherhead, as I call it. I mean, this is uh, they, they they list me as corporal, mm -hmm. and uh, but this is all the latest stuff that's happening, and it's just intriguing as the Dickens to read. And uh, here, here's a leatherneck. Uh, from 1943. Get a difference. Wow. <laughs> Advertising in Chesterfield. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Every cigarette uh, yeah. manufacturer is in here. Both Prince Albert. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they, they gave us some good dope. You know, they, even back then they were talking about uh, armor. Which, of course, we didn't get, but that's all right. But... Uh, yeah, it is. I laugh at the difference in them. Everybody's happy and smiling. Yeah. Okay. See that? Take care of that. This is the history of the 5th Marine Division. That's uh -huh. our uh, division. And as the 5th, we only had one action, which was Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. But the guys who made up the 5th, had been in lots of other places, right? In, in different outfits. Absolutely. Uh, it, was, it was quite a.
Yeah, well, that, that, that's the beach. I mean, that's... Uh, see, when I say the wrecked LCV piece, you see right. all, all cattywampus there? So the green beach was right here. This was where I landed, right there. Our job was to cut across and then go this way. The other ones went this way, then finally we went, and I got hit somewhere up and around here, just the other side of the airfield. Because they, they were just, uh, they, they just had us cold. Mm -hmm. Did, um, uh, 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 now were the, the, the fellows that, that raised the flags, were the flag, the, the famous picture. Well, uh, yeah, there's, there, there were, they actually raised two flags. Right. They put one up and it was too small, so they went and got a bigger one. Mm -hmm. And that was the one that, they, that the photograph that, was, that the photograph was, was the bigger one. one. Yeah. But it was the same group, as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah, they, right. They were from well, there's a, there's, there's a book that I read called the Flags, of, Flags of Our Fathers. Yeah, yes. I got it right over there. Right, right. It's a fascinating book. Yeah, they, uh, about. they came from, uh, as I recall, E Company. And the guy who is the uh, mainstay of uh, this organization mm -hmm. is, is Dave Severs. He was company commander when he sent him up there. I see. He was on but they were, but they were Fifth Marines, right? I mean, were they? Oh yeah. They, they were. They were in. They were a part of your unit. Did yeah. you Did you know any of them? No, not. Okay. Personally. I didn't know whether because I know there was a lot of them there. So you, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, this just takes it day by day. Uh, you know where we were at different places, but that's kind of the the scene. I mean, it was. Here, see, I mean, they just, they broach, they turn sideways, turn over. Wow. That, that's where I got the 50 caliber, see, off of one of those. How many Marines were in the 28th? How many were in your, your unit? Your the 28th Marine Regiment was mm -hmm. about 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because now that's three divisions. Yeah, I know that... Uh, a lot of times when they the guys now talk to me about a brigade this and that and the other thing I get whoa 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 right, whoa, you know. right. but uh, a company uh, is made up of uh, like four platoons headquarters first second third mm -hmm. okay uh, maybe a, a years ago it used to have a weapons platoon that's where the mortar and right. the uh, machine guns were and uh, then a, a battalion is made up of three rifle companies mm -hmm. and one headquarters company now that's your motor you know, transport and that yes, right. thing and supplies and uh, okay now we got up the battalion and a regiment is made up of three battalions mm -hmm. okay I mean so you mm -hmm. know you get that progression yeah exactly there. And, exactly uh, that's where you get to 20,000 and uh, now that's a rough thing what company were you in I was regimental weapons company regimental weapons company and uh, the reason that I didn't, after I got hit, I went out aboard ship. Uh, I was ready to go back on the beach uh -huh. because they were shuttling back and forth. As a matter of fact, I had even gone to the... Uh, uh, Tom, I got a different one. It might be a little easier to look at. But um, I had gone down to the bakery on this AKA and talked them out of about five loaves of bread. I said, I'm going to take them back to my guys on the beach. Well, I was standing there at the rail ready to offload. And the word came out that no more back on the beach. Because we had ended up, if you look at the size of that island, Tom, we ended up with something like 60,000 Marines on that island. And it was so simple. Jap, all he had to do was to stand up on a hill and shoot, and he was probably going to hit a Marine, because we were, we were just... Very, see, that, that island was a uh, mile and a half long. I think it was eight square miles, is all of this. Uh -huh. They had half of it, and we had 60,000 Marines on the bottom half, you know. So they said, no more back on the beach. I said, well, it's old sail <laughs> That's why I went to Guam rather than back on the beach. Right. I'd rather now. I know. I wish the heck I had, I had fought like the Dickens and, uh, you know, because nobody knew who you were. I, this thing isn't recording, is it anymore? Well, no, I am, but I'll take anything. Oh, you, I, anything I, I, out. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, when you're aboard ship like that, uh -huh. you come in as a casual. There are no records of who you are or anything right. like that. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So uh, I, it would have been easy for me to. Just say, well, the heck with that, and, and watch and be out there. And when I saw something, hey, you guys going to the beach? Yeah, let me go. They would say, get on. Right. They, they didn't care. Yeah, they, they, they weren't checking your wounds. They no, just said, get no, on. No, and you sir. wish you had done that. Yeah, I wish I had. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you sometimes look at that with the, 
little mixed emotion because right. you say, well, maybe if well, I at had the time, maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. well, you get all wound up. Okay, this is just another one on Ewo. Yeah, uh, I've got one buddy uh, still alive. Yeah, this might be easier because I want to take some of these and 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 scan them and use them in the show. So I might. Yeah, I mean, you can yeah, take with you, right. and I'll, I'll beat you up. You know, I know where you live. If you no, 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 I'll give, no I'll, give, I'll give them back to you. Everything I take today, I'm going to give back to you on Wednesday yeah. when we do the so, show. I'm going to hand it back uh, to you. Charlie Ringler lives up in uh, Kilgore. Uh, he, he was in the same company I was, mm -hmm. and he's the last one. Uh, uh, Jones, Wyndham, all Jackson, all my real close buddies, are, you know, they were in their 80s, and so they're, uh, I'm 82. Right. So you know we're we're not bulletproof, and I don't care what you say, Tom. You can see that light. <laughs> it's a lot lighter now than than you did when you were twenty. <laughs> yes, sir. So this is where you landed at Green Green Bay. Yes, here sir. At the... And we were right under the mountain there. You know they were looking right down. Of course they had so many targets. As a matter of fact, there was one time once we got our gun in action, uh, they got on us with a machine gun. Uh, and we're hitting the shield, and oh, they had so many targets of opportunity, though they didn't have to stay on one. They just banged at us for a little while there, and uh, Jones stood up and stepped out and got hit right real high up in the thigh here. And mm -hmm. I had to patch him up and float him back down to the beach. But uh, you, you just wait, and they, they would find somebody else to shoot at, you know. And so we we, we took some rounds on the on the shield. So. Uh... You landed at Green. So this photograph here, that quite a ways down. This would be uh, well. But this yeah. is the this is the scene of 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 where you were. I mean, no, well, I was I was way up there, real close. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. This is an inlet right here, I guess. No, that's or, yeah. That's the that's the uh -huh. Pacific Ocean there, and that's where we, our boat came in. One of the problems that we ran into, Tom, if you see what these guys are running into here, it's it's fairly flat here, and then this thing comes up. Then you go a little further, and another one comes up. These are terraces that I understand were kind of thrown up in, in, in a couple of different severe storms. And the problem was running in that sand. It was just, well, you couldn't oh. run. You thought you were running, <laughs> but you weren't. Uh, as you can see, some of this stuff here, uh, you, you try to get up and it was just... So this picture could have, this picture was or could very well have been taken on the day you landed, right? And that is the landing. That is yes, the sir. day you landed. That is the landing. So if you were... What's that caption say on Fifth Marine... Uh, uh, at, the, at the foot of Mount Sarabachi, well, yeah, under yeah. heavy fire, so... But yeah, that... Uh, they, and then they wheel, they wheel it to the left towards yeah. Sarabachi. Yeah, well, see now. So you landed closer to the foot than this, this photographer. Remember, I, I mentioned to you, uh, here's the mountain, here's the 28th Marines, here's the 27th. Mm -hmm. I, we're 5th Division, they're 5th Division too. Mm -hmm. This could be the 27th because mm -hmm. they're quite a ways away from the mountain. Right. Uh, and we would have been. 28th landed closer to the mountain. Yeah, off that green beach. If, uh, if you, Goodness gracious. And now here's that. Uh, this, yeah. Yeah, this was our job. Let's get back to Bougainville. Uh -huh. This was our job, uh, okay, uh, to come through the lines up to this hill here, Hill mm -hmm. 1000, and climb it and uh, hold it because they said that's the commanding terrain. But when we got up there, you couldn't see anything because we were above the treetops. It was just like flying over Vietnam. You know, when you get up high, all you see is the trees. You well, can't really see anything now. Right. Of course, we had maps, and we set up our 81 mortars uh, to zero in on, uh, like, this trail right here, the river crossing. Uh, we had maps, so we didn't know, well, okay, that's... Uh, 800 yards from us, and it's on this azimuth. We can set up a stake and put our gun, and we're not firing, we're not seeing the target, we're just seeing the stake. 
which is right in line with the target. Mm -hmm. And then what you need to do after that is get as guesstimate your range. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you usually do will be to drop a smoke round. And you have an observer up there that uh, can spot the smoke. And then he says, okay, now you've got to raise it or, or drop it or move right or left. And he tells us, so he puts you on target. So you, mm -hmm. Once you get that lined up, you make your little firing uh, chart for it. Well, they can call you on the phone and, um, and say, okay, uh, uh, B2. Yeah. And you just know what stake that is. You move the gun over on that, set the ranges and that. So mortars, it's a, it's a real terrific weapon. Have you got any more uh, photographs from, from then? Did you take any pictures that's or that's, did you? This is what we used to wear here. Yeah. This was when I was in the Paris Regiment. That's the original one too. Right. Yeah. Okay, there's uh, uh, Bougainville and Iwo Jima. Right. And this is uh, uh, defense, American defense. Everybody gets colorful ribbons, you know, but these are the ones that count, like the Vietnam and uh, those. And that's the Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is the ribbon that uh, goes with uh, with that. So you, right. you know, wear that. And with the Purple and, and Heart. The purple heart uh. And just for that, if you want to read this, and then we can get rid of that. Mm -hmm. I think this book probably is as good as any for um, clear pictures mm -hmm. and uh, just, um, just, okay now there's see there's that terrace I was telling you about right. and uh, what happened to Jones and I uh, that's the fellow that was with me when we got the decorations there uh, the 37s are, are, are too ungainly to manhandle, so they took them and put them on top of a 2x6 frame on a weasel, which is a little short. It's a cargo, uh, fully tracked vehicle, mm -hmm. and it could, it could climb through the sand. And uh, they, they put the guns on there, they landed, and they took off. and. Jones and I were laying right along that, uh, and I, I could look down there and I could see the mortar shells that were coming this way. And I knew that they had that to the inch, really, that uh, that island laid out like that. So I uh, told Jones, I, I looked up and I could see our gun, or a gun, I don't know if it was uh, mine or not, but it was up there and it tipped in a ditch on mm -hmm. top of the weasel. So I said, Jones, let's go get that thing in apparition. So we took off running and uh, worked our way up to it. Uh, long story short, had to cut it off and bounce it on the ground because it was just hanging there. We had to cut it loose and finally got it all bore sighted and ready to go again. And then that's when they got on us with the machine gun. Right. Jones stepped out and got hit. So I took him back and then that was the last I've ever seen of him. <laughs> and I, I called tracked him down on the internet and uh, ended up talking with his son, of all things. Wow. And uh, Deacon had died nine years ago. Oh my goodness. And uh, he went on uh, to become a, uh, he went to University of Alabama, then he went to Harvard, and he got, I think, a doctorate, and he was teaching uh, up there at, at a, one of the college, colleges up there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, that. <laughs> He did all right. He's a good man. 
But it's interesting, he got a silver star for being with me. I got a bronze star. <laughs> but, uh, like I say, that, the way that's written up isn't exactly the way it happened. Right. And I've rewritten it so that uh, my family at least knows. But uh, yeah, this one, you can take whatever you want, Tom. I can't. Well, I say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand all this to you back on, on Wednesday. Um, uh, I'll show you one. Now, this is, See here? is this your citation for the bronze star? For the bronze star, okay. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, a scene on the beach that... So you won the Bronze Star for the same thing you got the Purple Heart for, is that right? No, I got the Purple Heart ten days later. Okay. They're, they're not connected. One is a wound and one is... Uh, one is, is for for your action. Right. right. All right, here, here this. So this is well, like... I say they okay. got on us with the mm -hmm. machine gun. This is, this is a 37 millimeter right here and I don't know I can't tell you whose gun it is because I can't see the names on it but that's on one of our company guns because we took another sheet of steel to the uh, 37 has a flat straight top on the shield mm -hmm. and w one thing about a direct fire weapon like that Tom uh, you gotta see your target right and you know what if you can see him he can see you. He can see you. <laughs> so we thought well we're gonna do what we can so we put another quarter inch plate of steel and that's why it's so irregular on top mm -hmm. to try to give you a little more head protection because when you look through the site the whole top of your head is above the, the right right so uh, that's the 37 and that's what they, they they hit with the machine gun Jones stepped out this way and I was gunning at the time I just slid back he stepped out and, and caught his round mm -hmm. so and there's a picture in here which I, I really enjoy in one of these that shows a picture of the first B-29 that landed in, on the island. It was something else. I'll tell you, I don't know which one it was. But. I know a couple of fellas got to uh, killed real early on, you know, the first day. But you know, with the amount of firepower they had their time, it was hard not to <laughs> get hurt. Mm -hmm. Is this kind of the I don't know whether this is the green beach or not. But it would this, be fairly close to it. Uh, is this see similar how, to what you you saw when you landed? Is well, this, all of this, this wasn't there. That's this right. was all later. Yeah, right. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that's typical. I, I think the one of the yeah, this is running, after the landing. Yeah, I see and, the tents and and uh, part of the problem time was the sand was so loose that they could land the stuff all right, but they couldn't move it inland. Because even trucks wouldn't run on it until they laid uh, those uh, perma roads, those uh, you know perforated metal things that they tie together to make a landing strip. Mm -hmm. uh, they got those down, then the trucks could run on it. Were you scared? Uh, I don't think so. You, you mean just you had a job to do? Yeah, kind of like that. Uh, and it, yeah, you would, I guess, Tom, if you, if you sat there and said, well, well, I was laying in a hole when we were running up to the gun, uh, I, you know, because you get so tired uh, running just 20 feet, you'd flop, and they're hitting in the back of this little hole that I'm in, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like a bomb crater, but it was, you, you could look back there and see the sand kicking. Mm -hmm. Well, then you watch, and when it stops kicking, you say, well, he went to somebody else. Mm -hmm. so that, you know, if you really stop, I suppose, and, and if it wasn't for adrenaline, I don't know what you'd do. Sure. But uh, I, I, I saw men, uh, well, every one of those guys, I'll tell you, oh, that's it. see, is that... Well, that's just some photographs of, of us on Liberty and one thing and another. There's, there's Deacon Jones. There's the guy that I was telling you. And, uh, 
That's a, that was on Hawaii, probably. And I, is there just going to be pictures of a couple of goofy guys making faces or something like that? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> let's see what's that one. This, um, this was given to me, if I remember right, this was, okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, this was made up and brought to one of the uh, conventions by another buddy of mine. H.E. Uh, Wyndham, mm -hmm. and uh, so he's got pictures in here that I don't have. And okay, now on the back he says, "This is E.J. from Chicago cooking." <laughs> See, now if you look at it, that's you cooking there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm down in a hole uh, cooking something. I don't know what. <laughs> Yeah, that's Ringler, the drunker in the hood out there. <laughs> <laughs> that was in, on Hawaii. Uh, we loaded a weapons carrier with uh, beer and went down to the beach. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Bobo Farley. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the guys proceeded to, that's my platoon sergeant there, old Stumpy, we used to call him. And uh, they got pretty well corned up, but I uh, was riding in the back of the truck when I saw my buddy who went to parachute school with me, Red Phillips, coming walking over to visit me. So I jumped off the truck and he and I visited the afternoon. So I didn't get in on that party. I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, these oh. are, oh, those guys did right. Some of these are taken after I left the company. So this was, this was Everybody sort of got a book like this, right? Or this yeah, one? pretty much. So you know, uh, I can go through my. Is this you or? Uh, no, that's oh, yeah. uh, somebody sleeping on Liberty. Probably. I see. Yeah. Hard to know what those guys are all did after the service because you lose right. track of them. And there I am. And that's, oh, that's Eddie Rojek, too, my buddy from Chicago. That's you on the left? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's the Buck Selders will be tapped. You can see that it was hot and nobody really cared how it right. was. You know. Some of those are on Hawaii. See, there's a 37. That's see, see the old spray right. shield there. Right. Uh, we we made them a little fancier. And, uh, could have helped. You can't. You, you'll never know. You know. <laughs> Those guys, I can see they, they always wanted to do something I didn't want to do. I'd rather go by myself and go to a museum, or if I want to go to the beach, lay down on the beach, and not have to say, hey, let's do this. And then they say, mm -hmm. All right. Right. Well, this is magnificent. What, what we'll do on Wednesday, the problem I always have with... Uh, with doing this show is I never have enough time. We, we, we'll, we've got 27 and a half minutes to, to, to tell the story, so we'll move obviously faster than we're, uh, yeah, we're, just, we're doing today and, and all that. And I want to, and, yeah, I, and I'm going to take give you a feel for Right, no, no, and I appreciate that. Um, you can wear whatever you want to wear is fine. I would like whatever you want to wear. Do you mind wearing your, your star and your, and your purple heart? Yeah, I do. <laughs> You don't want to wear it? Oh. Well, can I just take a picture of it? I think that would work. Would that better? Yeah. That, that, that would be fine. That would be fine. Yeah. Uh, I would need to... Uh, uh, um, do you mind if... Can I take anything with me and if I promise to give it back to you on Wednesday? Well, I know where you live. Huh? Okay. No, I'll give it back to you on Wednesday when <laughs> yeah, we meet at the TV station. Yeah, see on the back of these uh -huh. things now, they, 
No, oh, no, no. Oh, this they, is they, all about. Yeah, yeah. it's on the, uh, the private first class called temporary warrant rifle mark. Now these are weapons qualification rifle marksman, uh, pistol sharpshooter, then mm -hmm. uh, MOS uh, military occupational specialties. What you're qualified for? Anti tank gun crewman, mortar crewman, BAR man, uh, qualified parachutist. Qualified second class swimmer. How about that? Is How about that a biggie? That? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a biggie? <laughs> See, and then they, they tell you where you were. And you couldn't tell whether it was south or central or where it was. But uh -huh. then, okay, wounded in action. Western Brazil. March 1st, 1945. Yeah, let's take a look at that. There's a couple of things there that you don't... Uh, see things like this. Uh, I lost 26 days under some article. Uh, buddy and I got pretty well <laughs> corned up and mm -hmm. uh, missed the bus going back. <laughs> so we got back in late, so then they they, they put you uh, on a company punishment, and you can't go out, and uh, you, you can't do anything. But you know, uh, those are the things that you edit, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely, no, this is a positive story. Okay. Bougainville. One of the problems I have, Tom, I, I'm never not just, I'll just soon this and go on right. further. But, you know, the the VFW mm -hmm. and some of the folks that are there, and uh, I, I don't know. How can I say it? That I have yet, to, well, uh, any Marine that's there, I, I take my time and talk to. I don't go to any of the meetings or anything like mm -hmm. that. But and the reason for that is that. Uh, uh, I, I think there's a lot of phonies around too. Mm -hmm. No, I know what you mean. I, and I, 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 some that that will uh, embellish. Yeah. Why not? Who can you know? If that's their nature, they're going to do it. Right. I, it's not my nature. Uh, uh, anything, uh, a, a rifleman. You can take that rifle, and you know what to do with it. Soon after, his division was sent to Hawaii, where training for the assault on Iwo Jima began. Tomorrow, Ed Iyer will talk about why Iwo Jima was so important to the war effort and what this barren island, one-third the size of Manhattan, was like. I'm Tom Turbeville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley, brought to you by Mies and Associates. Tomorrow, the movie Flags of Our Fathers will debut across the land. It's the Spielberg Eastwood film based on the best-selling book by James Bradley, about the six men who raised the stars and stripes on Mount Sarabachi in Iwo Jima, February of 1945. Today we wrap up your introduction to Ed Iyer of College Station, whose 28th Regimental Weapons Company hit the beach at Iwo Jima's D-Day and started up Sarabachi. I'm Tom Turbeville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley. Ed Iyer commanded a unit with a mounted gun. Their job was well defined, and it was done so well that Iyer was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. Well, our job certainly was to get the guns in action as fast as we possibly could and uh, cover their advance on the pillboxes by putting fire into the uh, apertures and keeping the, uh, the enemy from returning fire as much as we could. Mm -hmm. Now, we're, we're talking about numbers of pillboxes. We're not talking one, two. We're talking many. As, as we did that, uh, we helped the infantry considerably by keeping the enemy's head down, so to speak. Our guns were mounted because of the sand. They were mounted on short little cargo vehicles called a weasel. Mm -hmm. And we made a frame, set the gun up on top of it. And they were in the LCVPs with us. They went out first, and their job was to get that gun up as far as they could. As we hit the beach, and I could see, well, there was in just a great amount of mortar fire, artillery fire, and so it, it just seemed not logical to stay on the beach when there, my job was to get that gun that I could see up there, uh, get it in action. So my friend and I 
took off and uh, we managed to get the gun in action very quickly and support the infantry. After 10 days of battle, on March the 1st, 1945, on Iwo Jima, Ed Iyer was wounded by shrapnel. We had left after Sarabachi was secured to everybody's satisfaction. The 28th Marines turned north. Uh, they, we were alongside of other divisions, the 3rd Marine Division and the 4th Marine Division. So we were moving up to fill in there when our convoy got stopped because of shell fire. And uh, I saw some folks that I knew in a mortar position a little bit to my right. So I went over and talked to them while we were waiting to move on. And uh, that's why I know it was a mortar shell because we were in defilade. The only thing that could have gotten to us was another mortar because this was a mortar crew that I was visiting with. So they dropped uh, two or three 90 millimeter shells in our group. It was interesting that of the probably 15 men that were there, I was the only one that was hit. Like most Marines that day, Ed Iyer was too busy to actually witness what photographer Joe Rosenthal captured with his award-winning photograph of the five Marines and the one Navy corpsman raising that flag. But later he saw it, he saw the flag, and he recalls the celebration. Shortly after the flag, now I don't know if it was the first one or second one, mm -hmm. went up all of the ships that were laying off shore started tooting and <laughs> and making noise. So in looking around, I, I was within eyesight of the top of the mountain because uh, that's, that's where our gun was, and I could see the flag, and it was quite a, quite a sight. The taking of Iwo Jima gave some 2,400 B-29s a place to make unscheduled landings on their way to or from Japan, and that alone gave safe haven to more than 27,000 troops who may have otherwise not made it. So we thank Ed Iyer and all veterans of Iwo Jima for their sacrifice, and here's hoping that the film, as the book did, depicts that sacrifice as you deserve. I'm Tom Turbeville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley. Yesterday we started the story of Ed Iyer, U.S. Marine from the Brazos Valley, one of the 22,000 who was wounded in the Battle of Iwo Jima, February 1945. This weekend, movie theaters across the country will raise the curtain on the movie based on the award-winning Flags of Our Fathers. While Ed Iyer did not witness the raising of the flag by those six men, he later indeed saw that flag flying. You see, while that famous picture was being taken by Joe Rosenthal, the war and the battle for Mount Sarabachi raged on. Ed Iyer was part of that war. His 28th Regimental Weapons Company had a job to do. He'll talk more about that later, but first a history lesson on why the taking of this small island, a third the size of Manhattan, Iwo Jima, was so important to the war effort. It was needed as an essential stopping off point for our aircraft between the Marianas and Japan. Here's Ed Iyer. Iwo is uh, about 750 miles, figure, from uh, Japan. Our bombers were leaving the Marianas, Saipan, and, and it was quite a long trip for them and they would bomb Japan, and uh, of course they were subject to mechanical problems, well, they were subject to enemy fighters, anti-aircraft fire, and just running short of fuel. And so we were losing B-29s and their crews trying to get back to their base. Iwo was a perfect spot for that. It was a flat island. The Japanese, the, our enemy already had uh, some strips prepared for landing uh, there, so uh, it seemed to be a logical choice for us because that way we could station our fighters to join with the, the bombers going to Japan and give them air cover uh, and it was also a place where the bombers could land if they needed to make an unsch unscheduled landing. Previous air battles in the war at Iwo Jima had stripped the island of trees and vegetation, left it pretty barren. No place to hide for the Americans coming onto the beach on that D-Day and then climbing Sarabachi. Well, it wasn't much to look at as you looked over the front of the LCVP, the landing craft that we were in, because it was just a very flat island, all, didn't rise up out of the water, more than, seemed like about 10 or 12 feet, no trees whatsoever, big mountain. On the, uh, it turned out to be a volcano on the left. So we just wondered why we had to have this piece of real estate, but it turned out we did, and we did. Like I said, Ed Iyer did not see the five Marines and the Navy corpsmen plant that flag at the top of Mount Sarabachi. He indeed saw the flag flying later, that flag etched in American pride by the famous photograph of the Marines who mounted it there. 
He fought day and night at Iwo Jima for 10 days until shrapnel from a mortar round eventually ended his combat career. Tomorrow, he'll talk about that, talk about the flag raising, and more about his service. Ed Iyer of College Station. I'm Tom Turpeville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley. Brought to you by Meese and Associates. If you are in need of legal services, please consider calling Meese and Associates Attorneys at Law. Meese and Associates, an involved community partner. Meese and Associates, attorneys who care about helping you and helping our community. Call us at 846-9608. Licensed by the State Bar of Texas, not certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Meese and Associates, attorneys at law, 846-9608. As you listen to this, Ed Iyer and Brent Mullins are taking the trip of a lifetime, a trip back in Ed Iyer's past. When he was a Marine, World War II, February 1945, D-Day at the beach at Iwo Jima. Part of the American forces intent on taking that small but valuable island and its Mount Sarabachi lookout. Brent Mullins lives in College Station near his property that is and will be developed into the Museum of the American GI. But this week, Brent Mullins' focus is to take his friend, Ed Iyer, back. Back to Iwo Jima, 63 years after he was wounded there in the famous battle that ended with the raising of the American flag atop Sarabachi, which produced perhaps the most famous photographic image ever in American wartime. Ed Iyer talked to us some time ago about that landing at Iwo Jima. It wasn't much to look at as you looked over the front of the LCVP, the landing craft that we were in, because it was just a very flat island, all didn't rise up out of the water, more than, seemed like about 10 or 12 feet, no trees whatsoever, big mountain, on the, uh, it turned out to be a volcano on the left. So we just wondered why we had to have this piece of real estate, but it turned out we did, and we did. Brent Mullins' passion, much like my own, is honoring veterans, but his goes much further. As a collector, a displayer of artifacts of Americans at war, which will all be part of the Museum of the American GI and South College Station. And his current passion is being realized right now as you hear this, his gift to his friend, Ed Iyer. They left on Sunday for a journey back to Iwo Jima. He's quintessential of the World War II generation, and I think a soft-spoken, true American hero. Brent Mullins and Ed Iyer have not known each other long, but it's a friendship that has been forged by their mutual love of history. Ed Iyer is a very humble local veteran that um, was in the 5th Marine Division. He, Before he was in the 5th Marine Division, he was a paramarine. He volunteered for the Marine Corps the day after Pearl Harbor. And, but he's a very humble, very kind um, man that I've come to like a great deal um, since we first met about a year and a half ago. Shortly after his wife passed away, he came out and he became interested in our museum project. And since then, he comes out practically every day and volunteers and uh, works on... Um, the various vehicles that we're restoring, and has just really become a part of our organization. Tomorrow, we will hear more from Ed Iyer and Brent Mullins on the day, the same day that they leave Iwo Jima. I'm Tom Turpeville. This is Bravo Brasses Valley, brought to you by Meese and Associates. If you are in need of legal services, please consider calling Meese and Associates Attorneys at Law, Meese and Associates, an involved community partner. Meese and Associates, attorneys who care about helping you and helping our community. Call us at 846-9608. Licensed by the State Bar of Texas, not certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Meese and Associates, attorneys at law, 846-9608. Yesterday we told you about the marvelous gift that is being given as we speak from one friend to another. Brent Mullins of College Station, creator of the Museum of the American GI, taking College Station World War II veteran and Purple Heart winner Ed Iyer back to where his combat service ended, the battle for Iwo Jima and Mount Sarabachi back in February of 1945. Ed Iyer and Brent Mullins met about a year and a half ago, and since then, Ed has spent much of his time at Brent's property in South College Station, helping Brent in his various restoration projects of wartime artifacts, 
vehicles, weapons, helping him get ready for Brent's annual reenactment of a World War II battle that's coming up on March the 29th. But today, on this Friday, they are wrapping up their trip back to Japan. A trip, as I said, is a gift to Ed Iyer from Brent Mullins. Well, his first reaction was, absolutely, you're not going to pay for this trip for me. And I said, well, Ed, it's already been done. You know, you're just going to have to go because it's already been settled. And he reluctantly agreed. But, you know, Ed's not not the type of guy that um, accepts charity or anything like that. He knows what a hard day's work is uh, his whole life. And um, I just feel like that we need to do this. And in order for me to enjoy this trip to Iwo Jima, I felt like Ed has to go. Ed is Ed was there. He was there the first time and under much uh, less pleasant circumstances. Uh, of course, the trip was free the first time too. They didn't. He didn't have to pay for that one either. <laughs> Some time ago on Bravo Brazos Valley, Ed Iyer told me about that first trip. As we hit the beach, and I could see well, there was in just a great amount of mortar fire, artillery fire, and so it, it just seemed not logical to stay on the beach when there. My job was to get that gun that I could see up there, uh, get it in action. So my friend and I took off and uh, we managed to get the gun in action very quickly and support the infantry. I talked to Brent Mullins last week before they left this past Sunday. Ed was a 37 millimeter gunner. He was wounded on the 10th day. We're going to go back and we're going to, um, I want to see where where he landed and um, see if we can maybe retrace his steps there and uh, of course visit Mount Sarabachi and, and just walk the whole island and get a general feel of what it was like. Brent Mullins has been all over the world collecting artifacts for his Museum of the American GI, but this is his first and probably only trip to Iwo Jima, and it's made special by the company he's keeping. It's a place that I've always wanted to see. I've always thought that was its sacred ground to, um, to Americans and especially to Marines. And um, I just really wanted to see the place for myself, and, and getting to see it with um, Ed Iyer. It's just a real bonus. Later this month, we'll talk about the reenactment at the museum property coming up March the 29th, and that's where you can come and meet Ed Iyer and Brent Mullins and ask them about their incredible journey. I'm Tom Turpeville. This is Bravo Brasses Valley, brought to you by Mies and Associates. If you are in need of legal services, please consider calling Mies and Associates Attorneys at Law, Mies and Associates, an involved community partner. Meese and Associates, attorneys who care about helping you and helping our community. Call us at 846-9608. Licensed by the State Bar of Texas, not certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Meese and Associates, attorneys at law, 846-9608. Yesterday, we started the story of Ed Iyer, U.S. Marine from the Brazos Valley, one of the 22,000 who was wounded in the Battle of Iwo Jima, February 1945. This weekend, movie theaters across the country will raise the curtain on the movie based on the award-winning Flags of Our Fathers. While Ed Iyer did not witness the raising of the flag by those six men, he later indeed saw that flag flying. You see, while that famous picture was being taken by Joe Rosenthal, the war and the battle for Mount Sarabachi raged on. Ed Iyer was part of that war. His 28th Regimental Weapons Company had a job to do. He'll talk more about that later, but first, a history lesson on why the taking of this small island, a third the size of Manhattan, Iwo Jima, was so important to the war effort. It was needed as an essential stopping off point for our aircraft between the Marianas and Japan. Here's Ed Iyer. Iwo is uh, about 750 miles, figure, from uh, Japan. Our bombers were leaving the Marianas, Saipan, and, and it was quite a long trip for them and they would bomb Japan and uh, of course they were subject to mechanical problems they were subject to enemy fighters, anti-aircraft fire and just running short of fuel and so we were losing B-29s and their crews trying to get back to their base Iwo was a perfect spot for that, it was a flat island the Japanese, our enemy already had uh, some strips prepared for landing uh, there so uh, it seemed to be a 
logical choice for us because that way we could station our fighters to join with the, the bombers going to Japan and give them air cover. Uh, and it was also a place where the bombers could land if they needed to make an unsche- unscheduled landing. Previous air battles in the war at Iwo Jima had stripped the island of trees and vegetation, left it pretty barren. No place to hide for the Americans coming onto the beach on that D-Day and then climbing Sarabachi. Well, it wasn't much to look at as you looked over the front of the LCVP, the landing craft that we were in, because it was just a very flat island, all didn't rise up out of the water, more than seemed like about 10 or 12 feet, no trees whatsoever, big mountain. On the, uh, it turned out to be a volcano on the left. So we just wondered why we had to have this piece of real estate, but it turned out we did, and we did. Like I said, Ed Iyer did not see the five Marines and the Navy corpsmen plant that flag at the top of Mount Sarabachi. He indeed saw the flag flying later, that flag etched in American pride by the famous photograph of the Marines who mounted it there. He fought day and night at Iwo Jima for 10 days until shrapnel from a mortar round eventually ended his combat career. Tomorrow, he'll talk about that, talk about the flag raising, and more about his service. Ed Iyer of College Station. I'm Tom Turpeville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley.